Now we're going to take a deep look at eigenvectors. I'm sure many of you have seen eigenvectors before in some butchered way, but here I'm going to explain everything in a self-contained way and show you why eigenvectors are both exciting and profound. The definition of an eigenvector is extremely simple. Given a matrix A, a vector V is called an eigenvector of that matrix if it satisfies this equation. AV equals lambda V, where lambda is just a scalar. We multiply V by this matrix, and we just get back a scalar multiple of the same vector. The prefix eigen means self, so we put in a vector, and what we get back out is itself. The scalar is called an eigenvalue, so each eigenvector has an eigenvalue associated with it. Now, two different eigenvectors can have the same eigenvalue. In that case, we say the eigenvalue is repeated. By the way, the zero vector will of course satisfy this equation for any a and any lambda, so the zero vector isn't considered an eigenvector. Now if you think carefully about this equation, you'll realize it implies that a must be square. If it weren't square, the input and output vectors would have different sizes, and we could never have any eigenvectors. So up until this point, we've always assumed we're only dealing with real numbers. All our matrices and vectors are filled with only real numbers. But you'll soon see that even if the matrix A is real, it can have complex eigenvectors and eigenvalues. But before we get lost in the details, why should we even care about eigenvectors? Well, if we can represent a system by a matrix, then the eigenvectors are the natural directions of the system. For example, imagine we have a uniform rubber cube sitting on a table, and we apply a force to it straight down at the center of the top face. The cube will obviously deform downwards, but it'll probably deform evenly. The top face will remain perpendicular to the force, and the center of mass will move straight down in the same direction as the input force vector. It'll be some scalar multiple of the input vector, an eigenvector. But imagine I have another uniform rubber cube, and this time I apply a force parallel to the top face, like I'm dragging something along the top face. If there's a lot of friction between the table and the bottom face of the cube, you might see something like this. Different parts of the cube will deform differently, and the center of mass might move in a different direction relative to the input vector, so it won't be an eigenvector. Now imagine a third situation where we lay the cube on its side, and apply force straight down and centered. We get the deformation to be an eigenvector again, but maybe the cube is more rigid along this direction, so the eigenvalue associated with this eigenvector is tiny. This means the cube will barely deform. So eigenvectors tell you how sensitive the system is to different input directions. So eigenvector analysis can tell you which points along the surface of the cube are natural points to apply force. If the material is uniform, then from your everyday experience you can figure it out without using any math. But if the material is not uniform, or if the shape is very complicated, like the body of an airplane, then you won't be able to just eyeball it, and eigenvector analysis will save you. We'll explore interesting applications in the next lecture, but now that we have some motivation for using eigenvectors, let's see how we can actually find the eigenvectors of a matrix. It all starts from this equation again, the definition of an eigenvector. Let's move this around and see if we get something. Let's first move lambda, v, to the other side. The right side is now the zero vector. Now note that I can put an identity matrix in front of any vector. I'm basically multiplying by one. Why would I want to do this? Because then I can factor out the v. So look at this closely. a minus lambda i is itself a matrix. A square matrix, actually. The same size as a. This equation says that v is in the null space of a minus lambda i. Any vector in the null space of a minus lambda i is an eigenvector of a. So let's spend a minute analyzing this equation. It's possible that the only vector v that satisfies this equation is the zero vector. Then the matrix a minus lambda i is full rank. But if a minus lambda i actually has linearly dependent columns, then there must be some non-zero v that satisfies this equation. Now imagine lambda is a variable that is free to change. We want to find values of lambda such that there is some non-zero vector v that satisfies this equation. We want to find values of lambda such that a minus lambda i 
is not invertible. If it were invertible, we just apply the inverse matrix to both sides and see that V equals the zero vector. By the way, a matrix that is not invertible is also known as a singular matrix. To keep things simple, let's look at the case where A is a 2x2 two two matrix. We'll call the elements A, B, C, and D. Now you might have already seen this before. Here's the inverse of a 2x2 two two matrix. You swap A and D, you negate B and C, and you divide everything by the determinant of the original matrix. What's the determinant? It's AD minus BC, a scalar. Now if the determinant is 0, then we're dividing by 0, which isn't okay, so in that case, the inverse doesn't exist. That's the only condition. If the determinant is 0, the inverse doesn't exist, and the original matrix is singular. But we don't care about the matrix A being singular, we care about the matrix A minus lambda I being singular. So all we need to do can be summarized by one statement. We just need to find all values of lambda that make the determinants of A minus lambda I equal zero. Those lambdas are the eigenvalues we're looking for. So this determinant here, the determinant of A minus lambda I, is a single variable equation, right? This has a special name. It's called the characteristic polynomial of A. We see that lambda I is just a diagonal matrix with lambda over and over again along the diagonal. We subtract this from A to get what you see here. Now applying the formula for the determinant, we get this expression, and we want it to equal zero. Remember that A, B, C, and D are just constants, and lambda is the only variable, so this is just a quadratic equation in lambda. We're just finding the roots of a quadratic equation. We can just use the quadratic formula. All this fancy math we're doing boiled down to middle school math. That's amazing. Now, you might remember from grade school that an nth degree polynomial will have n roots. In this case, a second degree polynomial, a quadratic, will have two roots. These roots might be complex, and they might be repeated. That's why, even when all the entries of a matrix are real, we can still get complex eigenvalues. So this was for a 2x2 two two matrix, but in general, for any n by n matrix A, you just need to find the roots of its characteristic polynomial the roots of the determinant of a minus lambda i. I'm not going to bore you with the formula for the determinant of an n by n square matrix, but just know that you can split up any n by n square matrix into a series of overlapping 2 by 2 matrices, find the determinants of all those, and add and subtract them all together to get the determinant of the whole matrix. So anyway, in general, for an n by n square matrix, you'll get an nth degree polynomial, which is guaranteed to have exactly n roots that are possibly complex and possibly repeated. These are the eigenvalues. Then you can take any eigenvalue, create the matrix A minus lambda I, which is an actual matrix now with constant elements, and you can just find a non-zero vector in its one-dimensional null space. You could write it out as a set of simple equations or just use software. But note that eigenvectors aren't unique. You can scale an eigenvector, and it'll still be an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. To keep things simple, you might as well find the eigenvector with norm 1. Now if you have a repeated eigenvalue, you'll end up with a null space of more than one dimension, but put a bookmark there because we'll touch on that later. Anyway, now we know how to actually compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix. By the way, the set of all eigenvalues of a matrix A is called the spectrum of A, and it's denoted spec A. So we've got the definitions and the basic computations out of the way. So now we get into the real interesting stuff. Eigenvectors reveal something deep about matrices. We're going to have to prove a few things first though. To avoid getting lost, I want to first lay out our plan for the rest of this lecture. We will first review complex numbers, since eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be complex. We'll then introduce symmetric matrices, which are very important to the study of eigenvectors. Then we'll prove that symmetric matrices have real eigenvalues. Then we'll prove that when a matrix has real eigenvalues, that means it also has real eigenvectors. And finally, we'll prove that symmetric matrices have orthogonal eigenvectors. Now this isn't just a list of random proofs. These facts build up to something amazing. Trust me, each one of these steps is necessary. Everything will come together into one beautiful, coherent whole. But I don't want to spoil the surprise. So, complex numbers. Just a quick review in case you're rusty. 
A complex number z can be written as a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers and i is the square root of negative 1. a is called the real part, b is called the imaginary part. The complex conjugate of z, which we denote with a bar on top, is the same as z except the imaginary part is negated. So the complex conjugate of z is a minus bi. Based on those definitions, here are some properties you can easily verify yourself. If you add a complex number and its conjugate together, the imaginary parts cancel and you're left with twice the real part. In symbols, z plus the conjugate of z equals two times the real part of z. Next, the product of a complex number and its conjugate is a squared plus b squared. It's a real number, nothing imaginary here. It should remind you of the Pythagorean theorem. Lastly, the conjugate of the product of two complex numbers is the product of the conjugates of each number. So you can easily extend this to vectors. There's nothing magical here. A vector with n elements, each of which is a complex number, is written like this. The conjugate of a complex vector is just the vector with each element conjugated. If you add a complex vector and its conjugate together, you just add the elements together, so you end up with twice the real part of the vector. Finally, the dot product of a complex vector and its conjugate is twice the norm of the vector. Now, since a complex conjugate of a real number is just the same number, if you plug in a real vector into this formula, you get the familiar formula that says that the dot product between a real vector and itself is the square of the norm. The formula you see here is the generalization of that formula to complex vectors. You can verify that the norm here is a real scalar, even if the vector is complex. All these properties will show up in the proofs we're about to do, so I'm showing you them now so you can go, oh yeah, when you see them later. Let's move on to symmetric matrices. A matrix is symmetric if it satisfies this equation. The transpose of the matrix is the same as the matrix itself. You transpose the matrix and you get the same matrix back. So if you think about this definition, it implies that A must be square. That's the only way you could get the same matrix back after transposing it. And here's a concrete example. Elements on opposite sides of the main diagonal are equal. The 3 and the 3, the 8 and the 8, the 5 and the 5. On the other hand, the elements along the main diagonal could be anything. Imagine that the main diagonal cuts the matrix in half, and each half is a reflection of the other. So why are we suddenly talking about symmetric matrices? Well, symmetric matrices are worth studying. They show up naturally in many problems, and we'll see later that they tell us a lot about arbitrary matrices. We study symmetric matrices first to gather insights and work our way up. So we'll stick to real symmetric matrices for the rest of this lecture. Now we've got all our tools. Time for our first proof. We're going to prove that symmetric matrices have real eigenvalues, no complex eigenvalues. So assume the matrix A is symmetric and real, and once again we start with our one equation, the definition of an eigenvector, AV equals lambda V. Let's take the complex conjugate of both sides. Remember that the conjugate of the product is the product of the conjugates, so we can do this. Now remember, the matrix A is real, so the conjugate does nothing. Now let's take the transpose of both sides, like this. Now we can distribute the transpose, and remember we have to reverse the order, so we get this. Note that the lambda and its conjugate are scalars, so the transpose does nothing. So I've just written that last line up here for clarity. Now we use the fact that A is symmetric it's equal to its transpose. So now let's multiply both sides by the vector v. Why? Because remember, v is an eigenvector of a, so av is just lambda v. And let's pull out the lambda. See where I'm going with this? Now we'll recognize that the dot product of v and its conjugate is just the norm squared, which is just a scalar, and we know an eigenvector cannot be the zero vector, so the norm can't be zero. So we can divide both sides by it. This gives us lambda equals the conjugate of lambda. The only way that's possible is if the imaginary part of lambda is zero. In other words, lambda is a real number. There we go. There were a few steps, but just by using some basic properties, we've proved that all eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix must be real. This is a crucial fact. Now that we've conquered that, on to the next proof. Now we'll show that if a matrix has a real eigenvalue, then we can always find a real eigenvector associated with that eigenvalue. So we'll start by assuming lambda is real and A is a real square matrix. Once again, AV equals lambda V. Conjugate both sides, distribute the conjugation, A is real, but this time lambda is also real, so we get this. 
Now here's a nice trick. Add AV to both sides. We know AV is just lambda V, but we're only going to make that substitution on the right hand side. Let's bring that to the top. And from the left hand side, let's factor out the matrix A. And from the right hand side, let's factor out lambda. Notice the quantities inside the parentheses are the same on both sides. Also notice that V plus the conjugate of V is just two times the real part of V, just like we've seen before. So let's divide both sides by two. Now we see the real part of V is itself another eigenvector of A with the same eigenvalue lambda. Be careful though. This proof doesn't show that A doesn't have any complex eigenvectors. It can have complex eigenvectors. It's just saying that given a complex eigenvector of A, the real part of that eigenvector is also an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. That's what I'm talking about when I say real eigenvalues mean real eigenvectors exist. Also notice that A doesn't need to be symmetric. We didn't even assume A is symmetric in this proof. Now if we combine these last two proofs together, we get the statement that real symmetric matrices have real eigenvalues, and we can find a real eigenvector associated with each of those eigenvalues. Let's move on to the next step of our plan. We'll prove that for any two distinct eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix, the associated eigenvectors are orthogonal. This time we'll assume we have two distinct eigenvalues, lambda1 and lambda2, which in general could be complex. We don't need to assume they're real. These two eigenvalues have associated eigenvectors v1 and v2 respectively, and let's assume A is symmetric, but not necessarily real. So we want to prove that v1 and v2 are orthogonal, which, remember, is the same as saying that the dot product between v1 and v2 is zero. When you want to prove something, it can be helpful to start at the destination first. So let's start with v1 transpose v2. Now, we know we'll need to use eigenvalues somewhere here, so let's see what happens when we multiply this dot product by lambda 1. Then we can bring lambda 1 inside the transpose because it's just a scalar. Now we're sort of going to go backwards. Lambda 1 v1 is just a v1, and now we distribute the transpose and get this. Remember we're assuming a is symmetric. Now note that v2 is also an eigenvector of a, but with eigenvalue lambda 2. We're going to move the lambda 2 to the front just to clean things up, and let's write the left hand side again just to make the picture clear. Okay, that's interesting. You can feel we're close. Let's move everything to one side like this, and factor out v1 transpose v2. This whole thing equals 0, but we know lambda 1 and lambda 2 are distinct, so their difference can't be 0. That means v1 transpose v2 must be 0, which is exactly what we wanted to prove v1 and v2 are orthogonal. So again, this proof requires that the two eigenvalues are distinct. But what if we have repeated eigenvalues? That's possible, right? The characteristic polynomial could have repeated roots. Two or more eigenvectors could have the same eigenvalue. In that case, are those eigenvectors still orthogonal? To answer that question, let me introduce another key term. The set of all eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue is called the eigenspace associated with that eigenvalue. There are infinitely many eigenvectors in an eigenspace. And even though it's not an eigenvector, we include the zero vector in order to make the eigenspace a subspace. So if we have a unique eigenvalue, the eigenspace is a line, a one-dimensional subspace. And if we have an eigenvalue that shows up twice, we have a two-dimensional subspace, and so on. Now, any vector in the eigenspace is a valid eigenvector with that same eigenvalue. Why does this matter? Well, it turns out that we can always find an orthonormal basis for any eigenspace. How? Imagine we have two eigenvectors, v1 and v2, with the same eigenvalue, lambda1. In symbols, we have these two equations. Let's just add these two equations together. We can factor out the matrix A from the left-hand side, and the eigenvalue, lambda1, from the right side, and get this. It just says that the vector v1 plus v2 is also an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda1. If instead we take a linear combination of v1 and v2, say c1 v1 plus c2 v2, then that's also an eigenvector with, again, the same eigenvalue. So there's nothing special about v1 and v2. We could pick any two linearly independent vectors in the span of v1, v2, and we could still describe the same eigenspace. So we might as well pick orthonormal eigenvectors. But how can you find orthonormal vectors? 
Well, put V1, V2 into a matrix and just do QR factorization. This is exactly the same problem we solved in the last lecture. This makes sense. An eigenspace is just a subspace like any other, so we can always find an orthonormal basis for it, and those basis vectors will still all be eigenvectors. Okay, so what was the point of that? All these facts together mean that every n by n real symmetric matrix has n eigenvectors that form an orthonormal basis for Rn. The eigenvectors are orthogonal, unit length, and span all of Rn. Now for the payoff. Let's go back to our eigenvector definition. It's amazing how everything comes from this one equation. This time though, let's consider all the eigenvectors of A. To keep things clean, let's make sure we've normalized the eigenvectors. Remember, we can do that because even if we scale an eigenvector, it's still an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. Now, each of those eigenvectors has its own eigenvalue, and these eigenvalues might be repeated, but I'm just going to give them all different symbols, lambda 1 to lambda n. It doesn't matter anymore if they're repeated or distinct, because either way, we can always find orthonormal eigenvectors. In other words, even if the eigenvalues are repeated, we can always find distinct eigenvectors. So we have n equations. Can we write this in matrix form? Sure we can. Let's stack all the eigenvectors together, column by column, into one matrix. A times this matrix is another matrix whose columns are the same eigenvectors, just scaled by their associated eigenvalues. One clever thing we can do is express the right-hand side as a product of two matrices. The first matrix is just the matrix of eigenvectors, but the second matrix is a diagonal matrix with eigenvalues along the diagonal. Stare at this equation for a second and make sure the matrix multiplication makes sense to you. I didn't do anything illegal here. So these big matrices are getting unwieldy. For convenience, let's call the matrix of eigenvectors Q. This is not the same Q from QR factorization, but I'm using Q because it's an orthogonal matrix. Its columns are orthonormal. Also, let's denote this diagonal matrix of eigenvalues as lambda. If you haven't seen this symbol before, it's capital lambda. So let's bring back our equation from the last page. With Q and lambda, this equation becomes very short. AQ equals Q lambda. Now, just a little rearranging makes the magic happen. Remember Q is orthogonal, so it has an inverse. We can apply the inverse matrix to both sides to get this. Q, Q inverse equals the identity matrix, so we get A equals Q lambda Q inverse. Again, since Q is orthogonal, Q inverse equals Q transpose, so finally we get A equals Q lambda Q transpose. And behold, the spectral theorem. This is it. The spectral theorem says that any real symmetric matrix A is equivalent to the product of these three simple matrices composed of all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. This is one of the most important theorems in linear algebra, and look how short the proof is. Sure, we had to spend some time building up tools and proving smaller properties, but once we had that foundation, the proof of the spectral theorem was only four lines. By the way, Q lambda Q transpose is called the spectral decomposition of A. Look, what we just did was amazing. I mean, look, who would have thought that eigenvectors are so central to the structure of symmetric matrices, and not just some eigenvectors, but all of them. They're all here in this nice, pleasing package. It's incredible just how much insight we can extract from the simple equation AV equals lambda V, the eigenvector definition. Everything we did in this lecture came from that. So I understand the spectral theorem may seem abstract, but let me shine some light and offer some intuition about why the spectral theorem is useful and profound. So let's take this equation and write out the matrices again. Note that Q transpose is a matrix whose rows are the eigenvectors of A. Now I can multiply the first Q matrix with lambda and get a matrix whose columns are the eigenvectors scaled by the eigenvalues. This is basically going backwards through what we just did. But hold on, let's apply an input vector to both sides. We're going to multiply both sides by x and watch what happens. So Q transpose times x can actually be thought of in this way. We distribute the x to each row of Q transpose. 
In other words, we're taking the dot product between each eigenvector and x. Are you with me? But the dot product between each eigenvector and x is a scalar. So this matrix on the right is just a vector. A vector with n elements. The first matrix with all the lambdas is still a matrix, but we're taking linear combinations of its columns weighted by the elements of the vector on the right. In other words, we can all write it out like so. We scale lambda1 v1 by the dot product of v1 and x. Then we do the same for all the other eigenvectors, and we add everything together to get one vector. But what's v1 times the dot product of v1 and x? It's just the projection of x onto v1. So we're just projecting x onto each eigenvector and taking the linear combination of those projections weighted by the eigenvalues. We can write this in summation notation and now it becomes very clear. Now we don't need the input vector x, we just used it to help us visualize the matrix multiplication, so let's factor it out of the summation and remove it from both sides. Now we're left with this beautiful equation. But what is vi vi transpose? It's not a dot product. If you count the dimensions, you'll see it's not a scalar, but instead it's an n by n square matrix. There's a word for a matrix created this way from two possibly different vectors. It's called a dyad. This is also called an outer product, since it produces something bigger, a matrix, as opposed to an inner product, a dot product, which produces something smaller, a scalar. So this equation here is exactly the same as the matrix equation in the spectral theorem. I've just written it out after going through the matrix multiplication. This form is actually enlightening. So the spectral theorem says any symmetric matrix A is just the sum of dyads made from its eigenvectors weighted by its eigenvalues. The very last thing we'll do is interpret the spectral theorem geometrically. I said at the beginning of this lecture that eigenvectors and eigenvalues tell you how sensitive the matrix is to different input directions. So some input directions may be very important, which means the eigenvalues are large in magnitude, while some input directions might be unimportant, which means the eigenvalues are close to zero. And now we can see that eigenvectors form a natural basis for the matrix. What do I mean? Imagine we're just dealing with two dimensions. Our input vector x has two elements, x1 and x2, and we're going to see what happens when we apply a 2 by 2 symmetric matrix to it. We know this matrix must have two real eigenvalues, and we can find two orthonormal eigenvectors associated with those eigenvalues. Let's call them v1 and v2 and draw them in pink here. Let's now project x onto v1 and v2 to get these red vectors. Then we scale these red vectors by their respective eigenvalues. Let's say lambda 1 has a value of 1 half, so it shrinks its red vector, and lambda 2 has a value of 2, so it stretches its red vector. Now we just add these two vectors together to get our output, the green vector. Returning back to x1, x2 coordinates, we see that the matrix A has taken x from the blue vector to the green vector. This is what every real symmetric matrix does. And there you have it. That's the spectral theorem in pictures. So we've stuck to symmetric matrices this lecture. But wouldn't it be nice if the spectral theorem could be generalized to any arbitrary matrix? Well, it can. Actually, that's the singular value decomposition, the SVD I always talk about. We're almost there. Just a couple more tools, but so close. Next time though, we'll explore some applications of eigenvectors. Eigenvectors are very useful across topics as diverse as mechanical engineering, finance, and red blood cells. We'll also introduce Markov processes and ellipsoids, which show how eigenvectors can be useful in context.